Michael Buckley is a life coach, a comedian, an author, and the original YouTuber who completely dominated the YouTube landscape with his groundbreaking show, What the Buck. In May of 2006, he started a YouTube channel and built a massive following with his clever and quirky celebrity culture and commentary videos, which was in and around the time that I first got introduced to Buck. The show quickly grew to become one of the most popular channels on YouTube and generated over a half a billion views. Michael has long since retired from YouTube and is now a life coach living with his twin sister in Denver. And as far as I can tell, is 100% living his best life. So please welcome to the podcast, the one and only Michael Buckley. Yay. Solid 98%. I mean, got to <laughs> Got to shoot for something. Thank you for that <laughs> lovely introduction. I feel very welcome. You know, you know, okay, not to make us all feel old here, but <laughs> well, maybe, maybe, maybe I am kind of a little bit, but here's a weird thought. And I, I think about these things sometimes, but so there's people who are regular viewers of YouTube today who weren't even born when What the Buck started. I know, I <laughs> it, know. It seems like, but it, does it seem to you like back then YouTube was a community itself, both both creators and viewers, whereas today it seems to be more compartmentalized, I guess, in these various parts. But it seems like YouTubers all knew each other back then. Take us back to those first few years and kind of what YouTube meant to you. Oh my God, that, yeah, totally. So, I mean, it was a community. It was so small. It was impossible not to know people. And I think back to one of the last times I think I went to VidCon and people would walk by me and they would have 8 million subscribers, 10 million subscribers, and I had no idea who they were. Right. So, I mean, it had just become such a big thing versus, yeah, we all knew who each other was. We all knew what each other was up to. I'm pretty sure most of us were on AOL Instant Messenger talking to each other about this weird website that we were uploading videos on. So, I mean, 2006, seven, eight, nine, 10, it was very small. Even the first VidCon was very small. And I remember they did YouTube meetups where the top, five or 10 YouTubers would just say, we're going to be at a park, come hang out with us. And now that seems insane, but that was like, I think the first one I went to was 777 and that was in New York City and we all just wandered around and there was media there. And they were, again, the media thought this was weird. So they would interview you like you're posting videos on the internet. That sounds weird. <laughs> Why are you doing that? Like it was so my first few interviews with the media were always so hilarious just to see their face trying to figure out how this idiot was maybe making more money than I was. And I went to college. I have a journalism degree. <laughs> so the first few years were just just hilarious. And yeah, the community was small and it was a lot of overlapping. So if you watched Phil DeFranco, you watched Michael Buckley and then you started watching Shay Carl and then you watched Charles Trippi and we all knew each other and we all checked in on each other and we all tapped into each other and it did feel very collaborative. And so interestingly, like one of the strategies that makes someone successful on YouTube is really collaborating and cross promoting. And if I saw you on someone else's channel, suddenly I became a fan of yours. And so that still very much exists. It's just so much more calculated now and in many ways a business decision, which is why a lot of current YouTubers have problems with friendships because they don't really know how to be friends with people because it does feel very transactional. And so, I mean, I, I see that. So yes, I mean, back in the day, it was a very simple time and a very different website and I'm no longer on it. So it's not like I'm like, oh, the good old days. And even at the end of my career, I wasn't one of those, the good old all days of YouTube people because it really just evolved into something completely different than I was interested in. So it's not like it was great then and it's terrible now. It's just something completely different now. So I just, I remember it fondly and simply and yeah, like it was just silly. Like it just was silly and lovely and exciting because there was no frame of reference for what it could be and what you even were supposed to be doing. Like, should I make three videos a week? Should I make five videos yeah. a week? Should I tell 
tell my friends I'm doing this in real life or should I keep it a secret? Which was another thing for the first couple of years, many people who had online personalities, their family and friends had no idea they were doing this. And then they were on CBS and they're like, I guess I got to tell my family I'm a YouTuber now. <laughs> so again, it just seems so, so silly. But, and now the kids, they're all YouTubers. Like they come out of the womb with a login and a screen <laughs> name and they're ready to ask people to like, comment and subscribe. <laughs> like they, they know what, you know, That's they so just, true. they know how to be a YouTuber without any YouTube training. It's just innate in them. Well, you were the first one I remember, at least in, in 2008 is when I, I joined up. But I, the first one that I remember who had a, uh, it was a bona fide show. I mean, there were a lot of people who were, I know there were other people who had like shows, but you had, I was mostly familiar with watching individual videos that people had uploaded, whereas you had an actual production going on. And I remember seeing that back then it was the it, it was a little different on the trending tab. They had like the YouTube kind of front page. And I remember seeing what the buck was on there constantly. So, you know, everybody who watched YouTube back in those days saw your show. And it was just so much fun to watch because it was kind of like it was good production values. And it was kind of like watching, you know, it was a celebrity gossip kind of thing, but not the kind you would see on TV. So we knew this was special just for YouTube, which is what really made that awesome. Thank you. Yeah, no, I mean, I remember a show called Rocket Boom around the same time I was on. Like, there was a Rocket Boom. They were based in New York, so I knew them. But, yeah, like, there was no... I didn't have any role models or I didn't see anybody else doing what I was doing. I just did it. Um, and then, yeah, the trending page thing is so silly now when you try it, if you see a <laughs> screenshot on Twitter and you explain to somebody there was most, there was featured, there right. was, and then the next, the most important tab was most viewed, uh, highest rated, most discussed, which is why it, you had a you had a couple of different paths to success. So nowadays you can hope you end up in trending or hope you end up in suggested on the side, but generally you could get a lot of people to rate your video or you could do a call to action asking for comments. And so that's what I was very much, I take credit for it because I was in my knowledge, the first person who did do successful call to action. So if someone did it before me, no one was as successful as me because the first day I did it, and it says this on my Wikipedia, so I remember this, like the first day I did it, like my four videos were top rated, most discussed, whatever. <laughs> so then the next day, everybody was like, what did he do? And so, oh, he just asked. And at the time it was a five-star rating. So yeah. I would say, rate it if you hate it, give it five stars, <laughs> uh, please. You know, and I'd ask people to subscribe. That was the other thing. My subscriber number went up a couple thousand in one day and everybody was like, what did he do? And then I nicely just reminded people I asked, like I literally asked people to subscribe to my channel. So then when that became like, everybody did that, I'd always be joking like, you're welcome. I did that. Like, <laughs> comment and subscribe. I made, you know, so I did it very successfully back in 2007. And so I remember the next day, everybody had a call to action and everybody had a little more strategy in their program. It should be renamed the Buckley call to action. Yes. Yeah. I love now we just got to find the guy who invented the, the smash the like button. That's smash that like button. Yeah. <laughs> right? They all say it in different ways that they're just trying to get their audience to be engaged and say the same. That's what life is too. Life is saying the same thing differently and it hits your ear. Think of all the great advice you ever got. You've heard it a million times. You just finally heard it the most interesting way from somebody. So it's the, the way YouTube personalities are repurposed over the years it's different shades of the same thing that makes someone successful uh let with your indulgence let's go back to 2005 you're doing a cable access show with a friend and a segment on said show is a segment called what the buck what is going on at that time Right. So I was doing, it was an hour. It was live. It was, it super prepared me for doing TV and radio and interviews and anything because I just showed up and I started talking for an hour and I, I, I just worked really hard at it. So I just, the goal at that time was just to get clips of myself to put on a VHS tape to send out to NBC, ABC, uh, casting people and just say, this is who I am and I'm hilarious and you should consider me for projects. So there was no 
I was interested in the public access show, but I was way more interested in getting footage of me. And it was really a rehearsal for being on TV. And I, I, I would write segments. I would do news. I kind of modeled it a little after like weekend update or the soup, which was very popular at the time. Yeah, like yeah. here's a story. Here's a joke. The, it was literally three sentences joke and then move on to the next topic. Three sentences, joke. So I did a lot of that. And then because my name was Buck, I was always playing with segment titles like Buck You or Buck This or <laughs> Buck Something because it is a great name. Or And then What the Buck was a sentence that I would say because I was on public access in Wallingford, Connecticut. I couldn't say the F word. So I would always say, what the Buck? And so <laughs> I would say that. And so that was just the, the name of the segment. And those became the most um, celebrity focused segment. So I wasn't going to, you know, put on YouTube uh, local news because I was doing local news and making fun of the mayor and talking about people who got permits. And I mean, <laughs> reading the police blotter, it was crazy. Like, like I think about it now, but um, yeah. So, I mean that the celebrity portion of the show was kind of framed as what the buck Michael Buckley's take on Britney Spears or whatever. And so, yeah. And that was, that was airing to like 40 different towns in Connecticut. I was a bit of a local celebrity. People saw me in the grocery store and they'd say table for two, which was the name of the show, table for two. And um, it was me and my best friend, Kristen. And we, we did that for three years. So as YouTube started, I was doing that and using that as the, the way to get some clips for those first two years. Do you remember your very first celebrity interview? I mean, like, Big time celebrity. I was doing, let's see, 2007, eight. Oh, I guess it might, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is probably two. The, I mean, I was doing TV appearances in, in 2007. It's all a blur though. Like nothing stands out like, oh, I'm interviewing a celebrity. I will say YouTube Live in November of 2008 probably stands out because there was Katy Perry there and Soldier Boy there and what now are super famous YouTubers who are still kind of super famous. So I, I was there, like I was one of the hosts of that. So I was interviewing and introducing and doing that. So that was definitely like fall of 2008. And then over the years, I've interviewed so many celebrities and I don't remember any of it. <laughs> and I'll just occasionally see a clip or somebody will tweet me and I'm like, oh, I've met Carrie Underwood. Oh, I've met Tony Bennett. Oh, I've met all these very famous people. And I don't know, like, I think it was almost like I was in so the zone of, I didn't clock it. I didn't register right. it. Like I didn't, I was so focused on doing a good job and being funny and making them comfortable that it never occurred to me to stop and be like, oh my God, I'm talking to like one of my most favorite people in the <laughs> world. So I was, I think that's why I don't remember much of it because I was just so focused on doing a good job. <laughs> was there a moment that you remember uh, realizing kind of how big the show had gotten or how kind of popular you had gotten? Was there a moment where you're like, oh, wow, that's kind of cool? I have a couple moments. I think like one of the, like I didn't leave my house much. Like I really was a shut in. I was married and I had dogs and I sat there in front of a green screen and I made jokes. My life was very small. And I think like the first time I ever went to LA and New York in like 2008, I was stopped a lot. And I didn't, I was stopped a lot or people would just yell, what the fuck? And I'd say <laughs> hello. So I think like that's when I realized it. And then even bigger scale, I do think the first, VidCon in 2010, there was a line out the door to meet me. And I was like, oh my God. Like, it's one thing to see thousands of comments on YouTube, but there's another thing to see a line out the door. And even the year before, like in New York, there was a thing, I think it was 789. And there was hours of people just gathered around me. And now it just seems so silly that because I'm, I'm so removed from that. But I'm like, that's so sweet that people stood around and wanted to meet me. And I do see a picture on Facebook occasionally because my sister was there. And I'm like, oh my God, like there were lots of, so I think that was it. Like anytime I would be in public, I would be like, oh, this is bigger than I am clocking it as, you know? <laughs> Do you ever miss any of that? No, I'm just not someone, I, I'm not someone who misses things. Like I'm someone who, I used to be so nostalgic and I mm -hmm. used to always like obsess about like, oh my God, high school or oh my God, college or 
I, I don't miss it. No, because I'm so enjoying my life now. And if I missed it, I guess that I would, I assume that I would work to become a YouTuber again. That's just not what I want to be doing with my life. So if I missed it, I would do it, but I'm so present focused that I tend to not go backwards. So if I think of it, it's like, that was lovely, but I don't ever go, God, I wish I was doing that. Or remember, I definitely would have savored and enjoyed it more. I think at the time yeah. I was, I always tell people, I was definitely, I had two areas that were brain troublesome. One time, you know, half of my brain was, this is silly. Like, I really thought it was silly. Like, I remember the first time I got offered a brand deal and I almost felt like an idiot. Like, I walked down the stairs and I said, this company's going to pay me $10,000 <laughs> to mention them. And I felt like an idiot. Like, it, like I was making $40,000 a year at a job and then suddenly this company was going to pay me. So I had a bit of a, this. so my first couple of years, my first thought was always, this is weird. Like I thought it was weird. And then my second thought was it'll probably go away. Like there's no way. Like, so every year I made a lot of money and I was very successful. I did have that feeling of you're, you know, this is gonna. And then around 2013, I knew because I just saw people who were so into this and I just wasn't like, I'm like, oh, they really want this. And you have to really want this. <laughs> Otherwise it's exhausting and it's tedious. And you know, people, you can see the look in their eyes when they're, they're signing on to Twitch for six hours and they're still making right. a video. And you're like, and you look at them and you don't want to say this, but you would love to be doing something else with your life. And mm. so I I got to the point where I I was, it, you know, I always say YouTube was done with me and I was done with YouTube. So it, it's it's been a happy, it's just a, I'm very grateful that I had that much time. I'm grateful that you guys remember me fondly. And I certainly had a lot of fun and have some such great experiences, but I'm never like, I would have done a thing differently or because I mean, seriously, there were years where it's like I made not great decisions. Like I turned down great offers. I was supposed to be part of things that turned out to be very, very successful. And, you know, I had to watch that in, in the time I might have been like, oh, my God. God, but now it's been years and I've processed mm -hmm. it. And I thank God every day that none of those things that at the time I thought you should have taken advantage of that opportunity. I don't do that anymore. I just think, well, you didn't. And, you know, life, life wouldn't have gone in the direction it did if you had stayed in that area or category of your life. So I'm grateful for all the poor decisions I made along the way that turned into mm. ultimately good life choices. How long, how long was that period of time before when you decided I'm just done with this and when you posted your final video? So, I mean, I was the, the, I, it's hard to not lump it together. Like I feel like in 2014, my life was just blah. like my career was not going well. My marriage wasn't going well. I was drinking heavily. So like that year it was, it's hard to separate at all to know. I do know, like, I do know in 2012 when I won that live with Kelly TV contest that I did want out. Like I was still making lots of money and I was still like a top 20 YouTuber, but sure. I was like, get me in my brain. I was doing rounds of TV interviews, like save me. Like I really, by 2012 was like, this has been lovely, but I would love to tap out and go do other things. And then in 2013, it was still going well. I was making money. I had lots of sponsors. I was enjoying life. Like it wasn't like I was miserable. Like it was just, I, I could see it was like, I wasn't gonna, like I knew I needed to change my format or do something else. And I really just wasn't willing to, like I could, I didn't want to vlog. I didn't want to, you know, do list videos. I didn't want to do gaming. So I just knew I have to do something else or get the heck out of here. And then in 2014, like that's the year my life just exploded. And so it is all kind Kind of lumped together. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just spent 2015 just struggling and going through personal stuff, still making videos. But that's when I did get involved in coaching because I hired a coach for myself around 2015 and 16. So then like the summer of 2016, it was a peaceful I'm ending the What the Buck show. I'm still going to stay on YouTube and make videos here and there, but it's not. I know this is no longer going to be my career soon. So, and then by 2008, I don't think I made any videos in 2000 and maybe a couple in 18. No, I don't remember. And then in 2019, my life was going really well. And I thought, I'm going to go on YouTube as a hobby. 
Like, I'm just going to, I have some extra hours in the day. I'm going to look at YouTube like I look at soccer and flag football, which are my two <laughs> hobbies. So I'm like, I don't need to make money on YouTube. I'm not trying to be internet famous. What if I just go for a couple months and make some videos? I did. I had a great time. And then after a few months, I was done. So it was almost mm -hmm. like that was, I almost, I kind of feel like I'm a professional athlete. And I, I, so I was a professional athlete. I tapped in and played a little rec league for a couple months. And then I was like, oh no, I don't want anything to do with this. So I don't, I loved it when I did it. And now it's like, I'm peacefully done with it. <laughs> now you actually put together a video called the end to yeah. end the channel. So you kind of, um, you closed out the book as it were in a very kind of graceful move to be like, okay, this is the end of it. What was it like um, when like going to press publish on that video, knowing that that was, was there a lot of emotions at that time or were you so done that you were happy? Well, that was the 2000 and si so sorry to interrupt. That was the end of the, what the buck show. And so that was 2016. So even though it was the end, it was the end of my format that had made me famous and brought me success. So I don't think I had really given it. I was excited about the future and still hopeful that I would enjoy YouTube and perhaps reformat. And so at that moment, it was a lot of emotions, but it wasn't really sad. It was just a bit of relief. And then the next year or so was a little, am I, why am I doing this? I'm making so little money. So few people are watching. I have a million other things I'd rather be doing. And so at that moment, it was more like, I still got some future, don't know what, but I'm going to hang out a little longer without the pressure of being Michael Buckley, what the buck. Um, and so, yeah, like, and if I ever came back to YouTube, it would be like clean slate, like make a new channel, do something else. And I'd be so, and I'd be such a good YouTuber now. Like I have the right mindset. I have the right emotion. I don't need to make a living doing it. So I could do, and again, I'm not like, I think in 10 years, who knows, maybe I'll be like, I'd love to turn on the, cause I love, I love talking clearly. I, I do think I add value to the world. I think I'm pretty funny. And I do think people would enjoy watching me. I just, you know, at this point in my life, I'm enjoying life so much that I, I don't wish to add that to it. You know, at some point I'm not, I'm not like, I'll never be on YouTube again, but for now there is no plan for me to ever upload a YouTube video in the next year or so. Cause I'm just enjoying life doing other things. As YouTube is aging now, I mean, here we are at 15 years old. I think we're starting to see more and more people retiring from YouTube and it's a combination of reasons. And one of those has just got to be burnout. And I, you know, I experienced this myself. I'm kind of going through a bout of that right now with my videos and I've been doing this for 12 years. And it's one of those things that I kind of like your, your maybe advice on anybody who has been in YouTube for a while of dealing with that. For, uh, there's one part of me that I don't even like to mention it because I realize I'm kind of complaining about a problem that, I mean, there's guys who have to work in coal mines and, you know, they're just putting in every day, just working for a living. And here I am complaining, oh, I have to make videos and it's getting troublesome. You know, what, what advice would you have for people who just have been in this for a long time? Is it, should you always have an exit strategy? Or should you just fade away and, and go? Or should you, is it just like, just, just redo what you've been doing and just dive in? I think it's like any field, whether you're a plumber or a lawyer or a YouTuber, I think you just have to keep checking in with yourself and asking yourself, why are you doing this? <laughs> you know, cause it's like, if, why are you doing this? And if you like your reason, then you keep doing it. So, you know, I think anything, when you have to just check in with yourself, why am I doing this? Do I like my reason? Do I think I'm adding value to the world? Am I getting something out of this? And also, and all, but also what, what is a slump? You can handle a slump. I mean, you can have a bad month you can have a bad year like if you're if you're if you want to be on youtube for the rest of your life you have to play a long-term game it's like your marriage you're not going to be happy every year you're going to think your wife is an idiot sometimes you're not going to get along for six months it doesn't mean you leave the marriage it just means you allow yourself some uncomfortable emotions so if you're at the state of your youtube career where you're feeling a little icky about it you have to ask yourself why am i here do I like my reason? Am I willing to have a couple uncomfortable emotions over the next six months or year? And remind yourself, I'm playing the long-term game. I don't need to fix this. I don't need to feel better quickly so I can, I have to allow myself to be a little disappointed. I have to allow myself to be a little anxious. You know, it's not like this is just, you know, fun and easy and right. Your brain is like, oh my God, I, I kind of feel guilty because I'm not a coal miner, which is silly. So again, that's like, that's <laughs> well, an I, indulgent I emotion. I'm just saying in general, if anybody's 
thinking like, oh, first world problems. Yeah. You know, you see YouTubers tweeting, I can't come up with an idea for a video. And right. other people are like, yeah, I'm working 12 hours and I'm a nurse. Right. So go, right. you'll go away. But again, we're, I think YouTube is a wonderful career. I don't think you need to have an exit strategy because right, if you're all in, be all in. Right. Like, this is who I want to be. And I like people who are actors, it's the same thing. Do you give up because you don't work for two years? No, you just, you teach a little, you coach a little and you save your money and then you get a great acting role in two years. So YouTube is the same. Like you might have a great ad since year. You might have a year with lots of sponsors and you have this false sense of like, this is kind of fun because I'm making lots of money. And then the next year you might make a lot less. So again, if I'm playing the long-term game, I'm willing to be popular one month and unpopular the next month and a little rich one month, a little poor the next month. Mm. That is the life that I've signed up for. And again, there's no need to burn out. I think bur you could read books about burnout, but burnout is one of those things. I think if we're picking the wrong emotion, we're going to burn out. Mm. So again, if I, again, hard work doesn't exhaust me using the wrong emotion to work hard exhaust me. So again, if I'm debilitated at the end of the day, I chose the wrong emotion to start the day. So I'm probably thinking, oh, what now? This sucks. No one's watching. And I feel defeated already versus if I choose to be inspired or I choose to be motivated or I choose to be curious, or if you're really struggling, pick a middle of the road emotion. I choose to be patient. I choose to be present present. I choose to be gentle with myself versus I need to feel better and happy and joyful and fulfilled. Calm do down. You, that can come later. <laughs> do you think some of the problem with uh, YouTube being a YouTuber is it's difficult to define success? It, I, I think everybody thinks, well, once I for the one thing, a lot of people put too much stock in subscriber numbers and they think, well, I'll get to a hundred thousand subscribers and that's, I'm successful. And then they get to a million and they, well, now I've got to have, and so it's always like, how, how did you define success on your show? Yeah, that's a good, and so right. Anybody listening, this is, this is life stuff, man. You have to decide what your view of success is. Otherwise it's your parents, it's PewDiePie's, it's the internet, it's the, you know, the voice, your, your parents who were, right. So it's like, if you don't have your clear definition of success, you're always going to be, you know, in YouTube invites comparison, I'm looking mm -hmm. at other people's numbers. I'm looking at, I can go on those websites and see what other people are making and how their subscriber count is growing and mine's not. So again, you, you have to manage your emotions. You have to think this is all fun along the way. Otherwise I'm just, you know, the journey is the fun part. And, and right. It's, you can't look at the numbers because there's people who have millions of subscribers and make $80 a month. And then there's some very smart blogger who has a hundred people really engaged and makes thousands of dollars. So you have no idea how much money people is making. And right. It's like, if you're, and th this is about the external validation stuff. Like if you're chasing numbers, it's probably always going to be a little disappointing. So it's lovely to have a YouTube goal. I want to get a million subscribers. It's lovely to have a financial goal. I want to make a million dollars a year. That's adorable. And yes, do that. But if it, it, I think it's always a little disappointing because then we get a million dollars, we get a million subscribers and guess what? We just wanted the emotion of success, of accomplishment, of achievement, which again, if you're managing your thoughts and feelings, you can feel in think that way every day of your life. So again, if I, if I'm waiting for the numbers and the money and the fame, I'm missing out all the fun stuff along the way. And then, right. It is a little disappointing. I have a great house. I have a great car. I have a great wife. How could I, and then you're annoyed with yourself. Cause it's like, I have everything I want and I'm not happy, you know? So You've been through so many different stages. It's what I like about your career is that it's always changing, evolving. And is there a, one constant in you, in your personality that you think you bring to every single thing that you're involved in? I have lots of enthusiasm. Like I am clearly a, a good spirited person. Like, <laughs> clearly. I, I, I enjoy life regardless of life. So I'm someone who I've signed up for this and I, I know what it's like to be rich. I know what it's like to be poor. I know what it's like to be married. I know what it's like to be divorced. I know what it's like to have millions of people watching and I know what it's like to have five to 10 people watching. Mm. So, you know, and I think I've always had faith in God and I've always had faith in myself. So I always knew I was going to be just fine. And also I have confidence. And the thing about confidence is my confidence is not, do I have confidence? I don't know how to play chess. I don't know how to, you know, snowshoe, but I'm a confident person. So I'm pretty confident across the board. So my confidence is not contingent upon my achievements or my capabilities. So I think it's my enthusiasm 
enthusiasm, my confidence, my adaptability, um, and a lot of, and my, again, my faith in God and my faith in myself. <laughs> While we're talking about confidence, what's it like to cancel yourself? Oh my God. Like, that's the thing. It's like, I, I, I joke about this, but I probably, if it was 2020 and someone saw my video from 2006, they would, they would take a clip of it and they would put it on Twitter and they'd say, look at this guy. Yeah. So I, I made really dumb, bad jokes back in the day that wouldn't fly now. And I know better now and I do better now. And that's, so if you're listening to this and you remember the, what the buck show and you go looking for it. I have privated most of my videos because I'm just not on YouTube anymore to leave my channel unsupervised. So I, I know my heart and I know that I said dumb things, but I don't need it. And I'm not embarrassed, but I also don't need it living and breathing on the internet where I'm not there anymore. So, right. I, I think I, I have compassion for that version of myself, but I always in my brain was playing this amped up version of myself where I'm like, I'm making jokes about fat people and black people and gay people. Like, and everybody thought it was funny. It was 2006. Like I, I grew up hearing jokes. I made those jokes. And then, you know, the people don't talk like that anymore. So I'm not annoyed. I'm not like the world has changed and it sucks now. It's like the world has changed and I've changed. And I'm, I'm grateful that I've evolved into a, a better version of myself who knows better now. You know, it's not my, my style of humor. And I knew early on. So, I mean, I softened my jokes early on. So I think I had a, like three or four years of just being a dick on purpose. Like I'm going to say, sh <laughs> I'm going to say shocking things and people are going to think I'm shocking. And then when I became really well known to by then my joke tone totally was less combative and less, you know, jerky and more. And again, a, a jerky joke is pretty easy. So again, those are my first few years of joke writing. They're very low level, dumb jokes. And so it just, you know, I'm not, yeah. So I did, I did, I canceled my, there is what the buck show doesn't really exist in 2020 like that, you know, a bitchy gay guy making funny about people's life choices or, you know, slut shaming that celebrity took naked pictures of herself. Who cares? You know, it's like now she's it's Bella Thorne making a million dollars a month on only fans. We should be celebrating her versus, you know, my online persona, which was judgy. And that's the other part. The reason let's be honest, the reason something like my format couldn't be sustainable very long is that's not me. Like I was very judgmental. Michael Buckley isn't. So to cast myself in this role, it wasn't like after three or four years, it's exhausting. Like when I see people on these talking head programs and they're so fired up, I'm like, I know what that's like. It's not that fun. <laughs> like it's like to be, you know, when you see that woman from that Tommy, whatever her name is on Fox, whatever. And she's just yelling about the thing and that, that and I'm like, that's not fun. Like, that's not a fun version of a human being. Like, and so she's created an on-camera persona that at some point she's going to want to tap out of. I'm telling you, if you're hearing this, you're, if you got, you know, you know, like Phil DeFranco, who was a contemporary of mine, he was smart in that he had a couple years of playing a character and you've been just, he had a, a, a thing, but then very quickly he evolved into a more newsy, neutral, delivering information. So he got his online persona of, SXE Phil was only about two years and then he moved on quickly versus me who just teetered along for years and years and years. Oh my God, what the fuck? Malazars. And it's like, oh God. So of course I, I became exhausted of this. <laughs> do, you, do you hold on to the content hoping that there might be a day in the future where what the buck can live and that content can exist with perhaps a, a society or a culture that would be able to understand that with the right context, this can stand and this can still exist? Or do you think that that is now gone forever? No, if I had time and interest, I would totally take a What the Buck show and I would do commentary on it. And I would, I did like one of those episodes back in the day and it was great because it was like watching my face, watch me make the joke and then be like, oh my God. So <laughs> yes, I do believe, right? Because I'm learned and I'm evolved and I'm not defensive. I'm not defending my content and I'm not like, you guys need to understand. Like, I'm like, no, I admit it was dumb. I was wrong. Yay. So there's no chip on my shoulder. So yeah, I, I imagine someday I could repurpose my 
content with, you know, an educational tone of like a, a person who's done some work on himself and realizes, you know, oh, and I could even do a do over like, here's the joke I told and here's the joke I would do now. You're yeah. welcome. <laughs> That'd be awesome. You have lots of before footage. That oh, works very well. before footage. Yeah. And here's the other thing. I'm not as bad as I think. Like, that's the truth. Like, if I, when I look back at old videos that I think I'll cringe at, I look and I, I've, I've never gone, like, I never said the N word or I never said mm. anti Semitic things. Like, I never said anything more that was just a little mean spirited. So, I, when I think about myself, it wasn't as bad as I make it in my head. You know, I just, I just, whatever, I've never watched it back and thought, oh my God. Like, it's more just like, oh, it's always like, that's not as bad as I'm making it in my head. Like, I just, yeah. (laughs) Time time tends to do that. I noticed that like videos from a few years ago, I cringe at, but videos from 10 years ago, I can look at now and go, you know, all things. It was a growth opportunity. Yeah, it wasn't that bad. (laughs) Yeah. You had a funny video that I just watched um, about your, what did you call it? Why I'm getting a divorce. 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 It It had an excellent thumbnail and it was so funny. And this was like... I mean, I just thought it was the funniest thing. It's like, oh, okay, I'll I'll watch this because yeah, of course, I just need to you know get this kind of gossip. Ooh, what's Michael Buckley going to say about his divorce? <laughs> and so you go through this bit, and then and at, at the end of it, you just say the reason why it's none of your business. <laughs> yeah. And I just thought that was such a, a good commentary on so much of the YouTube drama. Well, that happened. was a, there was a girl who kept coming up in my suggested feed and it was called Divorced Why? And her face was all distorted and she was <laughs> crying. And then I, every every comment is like, why am I? I bet she paid for a suggested video or it showed up in the algorithm. Like, why does she why does this have so many views? So it really was just a joke about a video I had seen. And that's the other thing about my YouTube life is I was never willing to really talk about my personal life. And so my, I was on YouTube. I was married for 2002 to 2014. My husband was only ever on camera once. I was Mm. never willing to really talk about things other than, you know, I got a box of clothes and, Oh, I, you know, I would give advice and stuff, but it was never like, I never, I always kept plenty for myself. So it's like, I always, and that's what I tell people who want to vlog and all that stuff. I'm like, you keep something for yourself. You owe like, I know when other YouTube vloggers have had trouble and then the comment section gets mad and they think they owe you nothing. Right. They owe you nothing. They've been in your life for five years at any moment. They can delete all their videos. They can disable comments. They can say you, they, they've given you plenty. They owe you no explanation about um, an affair or a child or again, they owe you nothing. Right. So whatever they give you is lovely and whatever they don't is probably none and of now, your business. And now, so. the, <laughs> and now the, the apology video is like its own genre you know it's like its own (laughs) it's its own thing on youtube there's a huge issue with oversharing in general and you were speaking earlier about having a character and understanding that even though the name is the same that's the character when the camera goes on and i'm doing that character and i'm making jokes about someone it's not me necessarily doing it i'm doing it through that character and someone like a howard stern is a great example of that it's him it's his name but it's certainly just like a contrived character that he's putting out there do you think that that's something which is a little lost on the current generation on youtube where the more you share the more attention you can get and the more drama and further to the divorce why i mean of course because yeah. that gets the views and that gets the clicks but then you start going down the trail of oversharing and kind of uh, uh, blurring the lines between what your real life is and you know kind of what your persona is on youtube So I think when you're fully yourself on the internet, I think there's a greater gain. I think you seem vulnerable. I think you seem authentic. I think people connect with you, but I also think there's also a greater cost and consequence. So if you're willing to put yourself 100% authentically out there and share everything about yourself, good for you. And people love that and they connect with that. And Um, but there's also a consequence of if that goes away, like really, who am I if the camera's not rolling and if I'm not engaging with strangers on Twitter and like, do I have a life outside? And then a lot of creators who they don't, they were teenagers and now they're 20 and 
like they don't know really how to interact. Like when I used to figure skate and I would meet the kids and I'd think, oh my God, they like they went to homeschool. They've been trained by adults. They don't know how to interact with people. And so like the same thing when I'd go to VidCon and I'd see these teenagers, they don't know how to interact with people because their world is so strange. They're always on camera. They're always soliciting engagement and having transactional relationships that they almost don't know how to be a friend and family member because they're so in this world. So again, it's a great world to be in like sh any show business or anything. If you've got some people around you to keep you, this is what's important. And this is why you're doing this. And this means very little, like other strangers opinion of you. Yes. You're impacting their life. And yes, you're a value to them, but you're also a stranger on the internet. So if your self-worth and your self-esteem and your purpose in life is wrapped up in other people's opinions on you, mm. you are screwed. You're there's never enough likes and comments and, and revenue in the world that's going to make you feel good about yourself so as long as you know that you're fine you know it's but when you're when you're doing the mental gymnastics of right. oh but i'm happier when more people are watching and i'm making more money it like i said it's always going to be a little disappointing versus i love making videos i think i add value to the world if anybody happens to enjoy it and get something out of it yay and now i go back to my family and i do go play football and i do have hobbies and i have a world outside of this my phone, which is such a small world that feels so big. You were talking to Jack Douglas of Jack's films. I, I watched a video of that and he was talking about that exact same thing where he, he said that he obsesses over other people's success. And I thought that just rings so true to a lot of YouTubers. And he, here's, you know, Jack has a huge channel. He's doing very well. And yet you can't help but have to check in on other channels and seeing how they're doing. If we're always comparing ourselves to the other people who are doing similar things as us. And it, it can easily just develop into this cycle. And I, I wonder about these young kids, the ones you were talking about at VidCon, which VidCon is kind of a zoo, you know, <laughs> and these, these kids are just having so much attention. I think, I hope somebody's telling them that this may not last forever, you know, unless you can grow with it and change and adapt. Yeah. And that, so, right. If I, you know, and there's the great quote about all comparison is a, a thief of joy. So if I'm in the science shows, if I'm comparing upward, I'm looking at Kardashians or Re Rockefellers. I don't feel good. If I'm looking down at homeless people and people who have let, like no comparison is valuable. And if I, but if I've got someone who's a role model, I sure hope I'm inspired by them versus threatened by them. So if Jack is looking at somebody, I hope he's inspired versus threatened because no one is a threat to his success. He's Jack and he's amazing at what he does. And that's that. And you guys are great at what you do. And I'm great at what I do. And there's no threats to my success. There's plenty of money and success and YouTube views for anybody in the world. Um, but yeah, like it's a, your brain likes to do that. So you have to catch it and do something useful with it. It's like, how do I not do this? How do I not obsess about other people? It's like, I just, I make a decision that that's, there's no upside to that. There's like, there is no joy in that. So again, if I'm looking at somebody for inspiration, motivation, great. If I'm looking at someone, it's making me feel bad about myself. I need to mute them in my feed because they're not adding any value to my day. You know, <laughs> you seem to be really, uh, um, you use Twitter quite a bit, it seems. And out of all of the platforms that I would guess, the positive energy of perhaps Twitter needs it the most, and that's why you're doing it. But why Twitter, Michael? So I I wasn't on Twitter for years. I forgot I had a Twitter because it was almost like if I wasn't pr promoting a video, I didn't really, I don't know why. And then this year, last year, with all the political stuff and all the racial stuff, I decided that I wanted to be more active on Twitter. And so like my tone on Twitter is definitely not necessarily who I am a lot in the world, but what I'm saying, I believe needs to be said. And I really like saying it. And I feel really great about my my worldview and who I vote for and the social justice issues that I'm passionate about. So occasionally I am very sassy about other people's <laughs> political sassy? choices. A little sassy. So I love, but, but Twitter is great for me. So, I mean, I'm someone, I'm not at the emotional consequence of it. Like some people tweet things and they fall apart or they're looking at the, like, I'm not fighting with people. I'm just tweeting kind of sassy things because I just think, again, my two best strengths are humor and perspective. And I think uh, Twitter offers me a great platform to use my humor and perspective. So I love Twitter. I do tweet quite a bit and I do, I use Instagram story a lot like that. When I stopped YouTube, 
for that was a great way for me to get clients for my business too. Like I would just talk and I would just coach and I would just, you know, be living my life and people were drawn to me. So as someone who used to be a content creator, it's a very easy way to feel like I'm being funny and I'm adding value to the world without having to make a video and edit it and upload it and tweet it. So I love using Instagram story. So that's Instagram story is fun for me. Twitter is fun for me. I have a really, I'm not on YouTube at all. I watch YouTube like old gymnastics videos or old figures. <laughs> Your skating videos or old, don't we all old Phil Donahue interviews with 1988. Like I, I'm not, I don't watch any create. So sorry to all my friends who are YouTubers. I don't watch anybody's videos. Um, yeah. So I, my social media relation life is Instagram story. Love it. Personal Facebook, just to keep up with friends and family and tweeting things to drop some bombs on the world. But <laughs> that's, we, that's my only interest in social media in 2021. We were talking to Craig Benzing, Weedy, Weezy Waiter last week. Him. We yeah, were on and Zoom he... together the other night. We had a Zoom oh, really? date. Me oh, and that's... Craig and Hank Green, and we had oh, a little awesome. Zoom date. <laughs> he was saying kind of the same thing, that he doesn't really watch you know, individual channels anymore. He'll, he'll jump into individual videos and, and watch those. And I think that's kind of a, I, it, you know, I asked him, you know, what were your favorite comedy channels? He's like, well, I don't really watch that. And I can understand that because I don't watch woodworking channels that much either. You know, it's what I do. So it's not the kind of thing I would do, you know, I make a part. And how did you end up getting into the life coaching? So I love coaching. It's an industry that I knew a lot about back in the day. I remember just buying books about it in like 1999 because I was a psych major, but I was never that interested in the pathology and the diagnosing. And I never, I, I didn't want to be a therapist. I wasn't, I wasn't interested in what seemed to be the traditional psychology type jobs. So then I heard about life coaching and I'm like, this is fun. And I read these books and I just, but it's such a goofy, non-regulated field. Like anybody could be a life coach. You could be like, I'm a life coach, pay me money. So it's such a goofy field. So it's hard to, <laughs> at the time I was like, I don't know what this is, but I know it planted a seed. And then I remember in 2015, a woman who I had gone to uh, middle school was, was a very successful coach and living a very fancy life. And I remember just seeing her and being like, what is she doing? And, you know, and, and so, and she was also the product of life coaching. Like she came from that background and she had been successfully coached and she had built a, a, a multi-million dollar coaching business. So like she was my reference point of inspiration and she would coach me and literally like five or 10 minutes later, I was like, oh, oh, so it was just so powerful. And so I loved it. So I was very successfully coached. And then I did some certification training and I started slowly growing that business. And yeah, so, I mean, I love it. Like, I just think it's the most, and I think we, again, coaching is we all need it. Cause again, if we're not directing our thoughts and creating our emotions, our life is just, you know, we're, you know, unsupervised and nutty and runaway train and you've messed up your life and blah, blah, blah. My brain is completely coached. And, and also the first thing I tell people when I work with them is uh, you're the problem and you're the solution. Cause if you're not the problem, you're screwed. Like mm -hmm. otherwise the problem is YouTube or otherwise the problem is my wife or otherwise right. the problem is my right. childhood. So again, I have full responsibility and that has been so useful for me. And at the end of my career, I'd love to be like, Oh, YouTube, uh, the algorithm, uh, my ad <laughs> Boo, boo hoo. We you still know? boo hoo so, about again, the algorithm. Yeah. I, I am responsible for my success on YouTube. I'm responsible for my failures on YouTube. I, it is what it is. So yay. So I, I just, I love coaching and I, I've just, I've done such great work on myself and the work I do with my clients. And it's just, it's so fulfilling. And it's so like, I think about the, like when I get done and this is, this going to sound more dramatic than I mean it, but like when I got done a lot of times at the end of my YouTube day, I was exhausted and I was just a little like, I couldn't wait to get away from my computer. When I get done coaching, I'm high as a kite all day. Like I literally am high as a kite and I get out of bed and I sit down and I'm like, I can't believe I get to do this versus, you know, YouTube. It was like, I guess I'll make a video or I guess I'll start going live on you now and hope I make a couple thousand dollars or maybe I'll sell t-shirts and hope to make $5,000 or I don't know. Like it was just, my desire was never that into it. Like, and I, I'm being honest with myself. I just wanted to be a TV presenter. I wanted to go host a talk show. I, I didn't have ambitions of doing all the things that you would. And that's what I tell people too. All the other stuff, I never liked it. I loved being 
funny. I I never enjoyed editing. I never enjoyed any of the other things that make a YouTube. I making a thumbnail sounds terrible. Coming <laughs> up with a title, coming up with a clever title for a video sounds debilitating it so is. again like none of the other all the things that you need to be if i was coaching someone as a youtuber i know how to be a youtuber i know to give you all the skills and give you all the whatever i have no interest in doing that so it's also lovely at 45 years old to know that so i'm not laying in bed at night thinking maybe i should launch a channel for coaching and try and get some new clients that way and you i don't want i don't want i don't want to so it's an easy <laughs> it's an easy I, I don't even want to do a podcast like all of my coaches are like you need to have a podcast you need to write a book and I I don't want to so I'm not going to I'm just I'm very much enjoying life <laughs> well you can come and be on our podcast I would love uh, to that's yeah. the thing and someday I will have a podcast someday I will write many books like I said when I was a YouTube celebrity and life was easy I I didn't savor and enjoy it so my life right now is so good I'm just making sure that I'm savoring it and enjoying it versus oh no no it, it's all gonna go away and you need to think about something no and, and make some more money this month and make some no thank you I'm just gonna enjoy my life thank you all would that be your best advice for a youtuber especially a young youtuber who just is just gaining their popularity it's like what what advice would you give them to well, like enjoy every moment of yeah. it like enjoy every moment of it and like i said like your reason for doing it and know that happiness is here and not over there so you know i i'm gonna and i'm also gonna find some balance in life so i'm not if i'm obsessed with it and i'm you know again there's something about and that's why i, I hate the word hustle because hustle is debilitating nobody really hustles their way to great success and fulfillment so i think you should be engaged as much as you want to be engaged so i'm not i'm not overextending myself so enjoy every Every moment don't you know don't be afraid to do a million other things too it's like in terms of content like don't be like me who got stuck in a format and just mm. drove it to the ground like i always think of the fine brothers who they they had a lot of shows for two or three years four years until finally in 2010 or 11 they got kids react and it was like boom so they the weren't afraid to keep so if you're a young youtuber feel free to do a million different things and and make sure you're doing what you want to do not i should have a gaming channel no you shouldn't not unless you want to have a gaming channel I should do a style haul. I don't know. Should you, you know, it's like, you should do what you're wildly passionate about. That's what people connect with. So, you know, have fun, take chances. And again, play the long-term game versus the, I need to be famous in a year or I'm going to go, no, 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 enjoy it. I'm going to play the long-term game. I'm going to enjoy getting 10 subscribers. I'm going to enjoy getting 25 subscribers. I'm going to enjoy, you know, interacting with a small group of people. I always think be grateful for who's there, not bitter, who's not. If two people comment, those are your two new people. Enjoy them. They're, they're, that's more versus all eyes on PewDiePie or uh, who I don't even know who's famous anymore. But uh, again, I'm using them as role models, not as barometers for my own success. My own success is me. Like I had, I had, you know, hundred views yesterday at like 150 today, you know, but it, you have no reason not to enjoy every step of the way, like inc including the self doubt. Like there's plenty of self doubt that's going to pop up. You're putting yourself in a public persona where people are going to have an opinion about you. So you better feel pretty good about yourself before you hit upload. So again, you have to coach yourself. You have to have your mindset ready and then you hit upload versus I'll hit upload and see what people say about me. And then maybe I'll like myself. Or maybe I'll think I'm pretty or maybe yeah. I'll think I'm funny. No, I already think I'm funny. So you can tell me I am or you can say or you can tell me I'm an idiot. I'm good. <laughs> I, I absolutely love your outlook on life. It is so infectious. And, you know, I think that's why Chad and I are doing this podcast, because it's something that's so different from what we've been doing for so many years. It's so refreshing just to do it. We don't care how many people are listening. Although there's no compulsion to do it for yeah. subscribers or money or whatnot. And that is such a wonderful space to be in. Well, Michael, it has been a blast having you on our show and we hope you come back and do it again. And I just want to personally thank you for those early years of YouTube on how it fun it was and how outrageous some of those what the buck shows were. It was just so much fun to watch those. Thank you. I appreciate it. It was lovely to spend time with you. And yes, happy to come back anytime. So you guys have so much fun. Enjoy your journey. And I look forward to seeing more and hearing more from you in the future. Yay! 
And with that, I want to thank all of you for listening to this episode of Chad and Steve Have a Podcast. Oh, by the way, if you are listening on Apple Podcasts, leave us a review over there and, you know, rate us, give us a five-star review or five-star rating. That goes a long ways in helping get this podcast some exposure. We'll see you next time.